everyone and welcome to another podcast. My name is Rattle and today I'm going to be chatting with a creator of a 2D horse game called Rope and Ranch and her name is Red. Say hi, Red. Hello. Are you going to introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I do my introduction. Hi, yes. I am Red. Uh, that is what everybody calls me, but my name is London. Uh, I grew up in Texas and I am a developer for Rope and Ranch. I am 24 years old and I have a degree in computer information systems and I'm very, very excited to be here today. Yay, thank you so much for being here. We have a lot to cover today. Red's making specifically a, a 2D browser game. A lot of you might know that it's that games are like horse reality, uh, virtual horse game, virtual horse simulator, which came like out <laughs> like when I was, yeah. No one will know this game. I know this game, go away. But it's a really fun game back in the day. So it's those 2D games that a lot of you might be playing online. Horse, horse, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's also a version of that. So we're gonna be asking you some questions today. Are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay, so the first one is obviously going to be a little bit about yourself. So tell us a little about yourself. When did you start coding? What other expertise do you have? Well, uh, like I mentioned, I grew up in Texas on a farm. So I started coding when I was about 12 years old. I'm self-taught. And the way that I started coding was because of Rope and Ranch. Uh, my friend and I just decided we wanted to make a game. And that's that's kind of where it took me. Um, otherwise, expertise-wise, I've dabbled in multiple things. Uh, graphic design, audio creation, video development, animation. Um, anything technological, I've, I've pretty much dabbled in. Okay. How long has Rope and Ranch been in development right now? So I started it when I was a young kid, I was 12. Um, but as far as what I call development, I typically say since 2017, because that's when we had our first release. Um, anytime before then was pretty much me just working on the game as like a portfolio. Oh, wow. This has been coming a lot, since you were 12. Like, did you did you have like concept ideas for the game or how, how does that work? Like since 12 is a, is a really long time ago. <laughs> It is a long time ago. Um, it's It's been over 10 years. I, Yo. My friend and I were sitting outside by the pool. We decided we wanted to make a horse game because we felt like none of the ones out in the real world were what we wanted. And so we just started drawing in her garage. And at some point I went to my dad and I was like, okay, dad, here's my ideas. What do I do next? And my dad got me the Adobe suite he got me Photoshop, he got me Dreamweaver, and he told me to go for it. So I just started coding. Um, but it wasn't until I got into high school and I started like actually learning from teachers and getting like actual education on coding and programming and logic and all of that, that I could actually start putting all of those little blocks and pieces and stuff together to create the actual game. Yeah, I, I can believe coding is not an easy thing to do by you know by the any stretch of the imagination. A lot of people want to start games and then they they falter because coding is not something that is very easy to do. Which no. is uh, something else I want to ask you is what is the worst and best part of coding for you? Because I just like asking this to people who actually code games. <laughs> well, the best part is is the creation. My favorite part is grabbing a blank sheet of paper, drawing it out putting what I want on that paper and then taking that and creating it and just watching it come to life come your idea is just made and I think that that's that's my favorite part I love knowing that this is the final product you know whether it's just a page or whether it's like four or five different things working together it's the mm. coolest thing in the world just to know that it's all come together on the other side of that, the worst part would be the getting stuck. You know, it, uh. there's there's nothing out there internet-wise that's very helpful until ChatGPT came out. Um, because you would, you'd go to the internet and you'd say, how do I make my horse do this? And that doesn't Google very well, especially when you're making a horse game. <laughs> so... Yeah. Now that ChatGPT is out, it's extremely useful to be able to go there and say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I already have. 
what am I missing? And it automatically knows. And I mean, it saves you hours of Google searches through Stack Overflow and dealing with people on Discord servers with coding problems who are saying, oh, well, why are you using this language? Oh, well, you should do this instead. And it's like, that's not what my question was. I had a problem. <laughs> and I think that that's the worst part is just that getting stuck. You feel like there's no way to go. Something I've, uh, I've, I've personally also coded some games, um, but small ones, like really like simplistic things. And uh, something that I've kind of noticed specifically in the coding community, it's always been the strangest gatekeep almost for me. And I, I'm wondering if you've had this experience as well. So I would go, for example, onto Very Reddit much. or some kind of Discord situation. And then I would say, hey, look, I'm having this problem. I don't know how to make my character do X, Y, or Z, you know, just something simple. And right. the inevitable reaction that I would always get is, what have you tried so far? And then it's yeah. like, then you have to kind of show proof that you've done something because yes. no one wants to help you. And I can yes. imagine that it's it's kind of that, I'm calling it gatekeeping, but it's that, that, that frustrating thing of you are not allowed to ask a question until you've tried every single avenue. And even then we will be, we will be hard pressed to even give you advice. That's my experience in the coding community. It's awful. So the fact that you mentioned chat GPT is kind of, it's, it's kind of sad and kind of realistic for me in a way, because these people forced people's hands. They said to them, hey, look, we're not going to help you. So you're going to have to go find other resources. And people did. So now AI is becoming the thing that people needed. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it's like, it, it what is really is. I get people all the time who, whenever I go and I ask a question and I'm doing a 2D web game, people immediately start saying, well, why are you using this language? How about you rewrite it in this other language? And I'm like, my issue is on logic, not on the other language. I'm not changing all of my code just because you came into the room and told me to change it. I still yeah. have an issue. Yeah, <laughs> it's, exa it's, like, it's exactly. I don't understand why it has to be such an aggressive thing to ask a question on on asking for help. And so I have a lot of players that have come to me and said, hey, I want to learn how to code. And I teach them, you know, I, I'll give them a small assignment. I'll say, here, go, go do this. And they'll go and do it because I never got that help as a kid. You know, as my 12 year old self trying to create a horse game, I never got that help. Everyone was like, oh, you're just trying to make a stupid horse game. And I was like, yes, but I'm also trying to learn. And no one ever gave me that help. Yeah, the, the it's not with all coders, I will say, or, or um, programmers, coders, all these types of people, but no. they, they do seem, seem re very reticent to share any sort of information. It's like they feel like they've earned this information. You need to earn it as well. But I think people like you, people who take the time to say, hey, come over here, I'm going to show you, is going to... Is, is more eager to, or it's going to be more helpful, that's the word I'm looking for, to open the door for people to code, <laughs> to make more games. It's That's what we should be doing in the community. We shouldn't be shutting people down. Good grief. <laughs> but yeah, we, we've been talking about coding for a while now. Let's move on. <laughs> this is fun though. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I, the next question I really wanted to ask, getting back to the Rope and Ranch situation, is what was the inspiration for Rope and Ranch? When I was in Texas on my ranch with my five goats, two horses, two donkeys, 10 chickens, four <laughs> geese. I mean, I, I had yeah. all these animals. If I spent the night at a friend's house, I was required to come back at seven in the morning to let the goats out. And mm. if I spent the night at a friend's house, I was required to not leave the house until I put the goats away because there's chores on a farm. You have things that you have to do on a farm. And so when we made Rope and Ranch, me and my friend, we really wanted to have that aspect of, it's not just collecting a billion pixel ponies. You know, we used to play How Wars and collecting all the pixel ponies with all the different colors and all of the different objectives. And that's, that's not what ranching is about. It's about working. It's about the chores. It's about dealing with the animals as they are, you know? So we really, we wanted to create a game that was very, very realistic to what it really was like being on a farm. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm going to touch on this theme a little bit later, but for now, let's chat about uh, your game. Tell us a little about it. How does it play? We actually did kind of touch, I think, a little bit on this just now, but uh, what features does it have, essentially? So to try and summarize it all up, um, 
we every player starts out with 15 acres of land. You start out with 100 moons, which is going to be the aging element in the game. So when you have horses, you'll start where you can age up the horse two months at a time, and you can care for them whenever you want. So if you decide to leave the game and leave for a week and you come back, they're still alive. They're still there. They're still right where they were. Um, we have a very big taming aspect in the game where any th- anytime that you want to do anything, you have to tame the horse before you do anything with them, like uh, breeding, training, selling, that way that it's, it's a tame animal. And I thought that that was a really good feature to add in. That's one of the ones that I set my foot down and I was like, that that's going in there. Um, new players will be able to catch horses in the wild every day. You'll be able to tack up your horses visually, and you'll be able to select a specialty. You can train in English or Western. You can go and compete in competitions. We have real real world working genetics. So like Roan, Gray, Dun, and Cream. That ends up with about 150 base coats, which also includes 30 paint overlays and 50 Appaloosa overlays and markings. So face markings, leg markings, all of that. We have donkeys, mules, hennies, and then the vet feature. And most people want to play where they're like doing the best of a certain horse breed. But you can also join like a breeding team where you can breed for like color, GP, confirmation, or crossbreeding. And then as you get on the game more and you level up, you can unlock goats and cows. Ish. Okay, so that's actually a lot. Um, there's a couple of things. What's a hinny? <laughs> <laughs> so, there is a difference between a mule and a hinny. So, if you breed a donkey and a horse, they have different number of chromosomes. So, when you breed them together, depending on the mother, whether or not the mother is a horse or whether or not the mother is a donkey, they will get an extra chromosome from the mother. Most of the time, people castrate their stallions. So most of the time, the combination that you're going to get is a mother horse and a father donkey, which is a mule. But if that is reversed and it is a mother donkey and a father horse, you get a hinny. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a liger and a you, you, you get another one. It's a it's a liger and a tigon. I think that that's the that's yeah. the way they, they the put it around. It's the difference between which chromosome they get from the mother, and they actually oh, act okay. different and sound different. So it's it's if you've ever heard a hinny nay, it yeah. is absolutely hilarious. It sounds like you're sacrificing children in your backyard. Good grief! <laughs> that's good. I actually, I actually fostered have... one, and uh, <gasps> my neighbor called me and was like, "What is going on?" And I was like, "That would be my hinny." <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you're what? No, I am not killing it, nor is it killing me. <laughs> Do not worry. Yeah. <laughs> My children are fine. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I know. seen George around in a while. Oh, well, don't worry. Don't worry about George. <laughs> don't worry about George. We, we, we don't worry about George. <laughs> Anyway, then another question is right at the start, you said that you start out with 100 moons. What exactly do you mean by that? So moons is the acting, uh, the aging element in the game. So you can get up to a max of 500 moons. And every time you use one, it it depletes. If you go under 25, you earn one per hour because it's stupid when you run out and then you cannot play anymore. You can't do anything. You're stuck. So it'll uh, increase if you go under 25 so that when you log back in you still have something to do so the the question that i'm going to ask is uh, what is the point of the moons shouldn't it be then just to remove them entirely because if you're not going to be able to lose them essentially then uh is it a is it maybe a better idea to kind of remove the concept of the moons entirely so you earn them from competitions and every time Mm -hmm. you age an animal it depletes down by one So it's the entire account has that 100. So if you have 20 horses and you want to use, you know, five on one, five on another, five by another, they go by quick. And it also will carry over when you do goats and with cows. And so Mm. those 500 go quickly. Um, Most of the time, everybody's always looking for more. 
but it's just pretty much a way that you're not sitting there unlimitedly aging your horse over and over and over again, and you're actually working to get some of that back. Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, it's not an open ranch yet, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> So most browser games are in real time, which I'm going to be honest, ticks me like right the frick off because I don't like it. I don't like, don't like, like games where they force me to log in all the time. So meaning a day goes by when you sleep in real life and wake up. This forces people to log in and stay active. Why did you opt not to make Rope and Ranch in the same way? Pretty much goes back to the farm life. Uh, I had times when I was way too busy with animals that I couldn't log into How Horse or log into Horse Reality. And as a kid, I was like, that's stupid because I'd log back and my animals were dead. <laughs> so <laughs> that was just when I was a kid, I was like, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I made sure that that was not something that, you know, I can do. On another aspect, though, if I had it to where every animal aged up every single night, that's so much working power for the whole entire server. Because I have like 50,000 horses on the game. So the fact that I would have to age up every animal, every single, I mean, that's, a, that's just horses. Mm. Every animal, oh, wow. every night, you know, and counting. It just, that would be a lot of power. And I just feel like that's unnecessary. I, I get that actually that makes a lot of sense you know on the on the development aspect the thing that just drives me crazy is it feels like such a scummy way to get people to log in every day yeah they don't want it to is. log in or they don't they, they don't they're not excited to log in they have to log in and that's like what do you exactly do you want from your players to be excited to log in or to be forced to log in <laughs> it's just no. Uh, yeah no it, exactly exactly yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad Rope and Ranch is like that. It's one of the main reasons I quite like the game. Okay, so the next question is specifically about the browser aspect. I, I've noticed that some people make browser games specifically, and I'm actually quite curious about why you decided to make a browser game instead of a 3D game. So when I was a kid, that's all there was. There, I mean, you had like the PS2 and you had games on like that, but even Steam games were hard to come by or even app games. And when I got into high school, that's when, like, the huge app boom happened and everybody started doing, like, apps and Steam games and stuff like that. But I had focused on web languages and that's kind of what I ended up knowing. Now, later on as a developer, and I'm looking at this in the sense of, oh, should I move over? If you look at Rival Stars and the way that they do, um, they have their desktop version and they have their mobile version... They're two completely different products. They have to have a team that does their uh, their app version and a team that does their Steam version because mm. they're completely two different games. So yeah. if you think of it in that sense, I'm one human. And if I had to make multiple versions of the game, one for Steam, one for app, one for web, that would be a lot of stuff on a single individual. Um, I've thought of ways to be able to bring it to mobile or bring it to a Steam um, platform. But as of right now, any developer I've contacted me or that I have contacted has told me that they are not willing to start on a project that isn't going to put down at least three fourths of the amount up front and that they will not commit to saying that they will do anything until the money is already there. And so if they can't even give me a quote, so I've gone to them and been like, hey, I need a quote. And they're like, well, if I give you a quote and it takes you six months, I don't have an opening in six months because they fill that opening. They go and they do something else. They go code something else. And I've also had developers that have told me that when they finished the product, that I don't get the product, that they publish the product. And I'm like, well, that's not how I want this to be. I don't want to be stuck in a constant loop of, me paying somebody else to do the updates that I am per perfectly capable of doing. I just don't know that language. So it's, yeah. it's a hard bargain that I've been kind of going between some developers. I've talked to like five or six different developers and they've all pretty much told me like, oh, well, when we're done with the product, you know, if you want to make touches, we'll add more to the quote. And I'm like, well, can you just give me the product and then I can continue it? I'm sure I could figure out if I saw it, you know, because at that point, it's not me creating. It's it's me fixing. And they're like, no, anything that we create is our property. And I'm like, 
but that doesn't make any sense to me. So no, it's- that's, yeah, no, but that makes absolutely no goddamn sense. Because if you think about the idea of asking a book cover artist to make a book cover for your book, then you buy, you pay them for their work. The fact that, hey, look, you know, they, they work out, they, they make the a cover art, I take the cover art, I slap it on my book, and then they go away. Because I've already paid for it. <laughs> but when it comes to things like uh, freelance and web development, I mean, think of it in like, that's what I have to do with my clients whenever I do web development freelancing. If they are a retail store and they have more dresses that they want to upload, I had to have this person contact me with the dresses and I had to go and upload all the photos and update all the descriptions and do all of that because they didn't know how to do it. And so it kept me with money, you know, they'd have to give me like $150 to go and do that update. But at the same time, it kept them in the loop where they had to come back to me. And so in a business standpoint, that's what most freelancers try to do. Whether or not it's a good thing to do, I don't I don't know. At some point, I told the woman, I said, look, this is not hard. I will show you a YouTube video on how to do this because this is this is to the point where you need you need to learn how to do this yourself. Well, you just gave me a very horrifying visual of what the heck's going on with freelance developing. Thank you. I will never touch that with a 39 and a half foot pole. Some people you will even put a time bomb in it. And so after like six months, it'll cause a problem and it'll trigger something inside of the program to make you come back because it starts causing a problem within six months time. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Let's talk about, (laughs) let's talk about horses. Let's talk about horses. This is getting dark. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. We're talking, shut up. We're talking about horses. So let's talk about horses. How many are currently? (laughs) (laughs) So you have 15 breeds in game. Can you give us their names? Which breeds do you have in game? So the way that it works is there's six purebred breeds, which are going to be the Andalusian, Appaloosa, Arabian, Quarter Horse, Thoroughbred, and Paint. And then we've got the Donkey. Now, if you start crossing some of those breeds together, so if you breed an Arabian and a Thoroughbred, you're going to get the Anglo-Arabian. Or if you breed an offspring that has both um, paint genetics and Appaloosa genetics, you're going to get a Pintaloosa. Um, We also have a grade horse, which is going to be a horse that has more than four, we call them bloodlines. So not to confuse with purebred. Um, Mm. But four bloodlines within a horse will create a grade horse. And then you've got all of the different offsprings of like a mule, a henny the Azteca, the Spanish sport horse, the Appaloosa sport horse, the Anglo-Arabian, the Appendix quarter horse, and all of the different ones that come from breeding those six together. Oh, that's actually really cool. I like that. So it's it's like if, if you start if you start with the six main, and, and you say you're going to be adding... Okay, well, we'll get into into the, the into the other breeds, but you're probably going to be adding more. So it means that if you start experimenting with the breeding, you're going to get different and interesting types of stuff. I think... I've, I've seen this in browser games before, but it's actually... I quite like that feature. It's quite... It, it makes the breeding a little bit more uh, fun and uh, surprising. Yes. Um, and a lot of the times... So if you take a Appaloosa, or let's actually do... If you take an Arabian and you take a thoroughbred and you breed the two together, and let's say you do this in real life, so just picture it in real life. You take an Arabian and a thoroughbred, you breed them together, you breed them three times together, the same pair. All three of those offspring are probably going to look different. One of them might yeah. have an Arabianish head, one of them might be more tall like that thoroughbred, and one of them might look like a mixture of both. In the same sense of humans, you know, you can have siblings from the same parent and all look different. Mm-hmm. So when you breed those two, you'll have a chance of an Arabian offspring, the thoroughbred offspring, or 
the Anglo-Arabian. And so you get a chance variable of getting those three different options out of reading two horses together. So which one is your favorite? So originally it was the Andalusian, but as mm -hmm. I've started playing more, I've fallen in love with the Azteca. So a lot of my TikTok and uh, like Instagram reels are going to be when I'm working with Aztecas. Ooh, well, I, I like thoroughbreds, so bite me. Well, an Azteca has thoroughbred in them. Yeah, but they're not pure thoroughbreds. <gasps> Fine. Me. Actually, they don't have thoroughbreds. Don't give me those. I'm dumb. Oh. Ah. <laughs> uh, so you're lying. You're lying. Yes. Nope and ranch. <laughs> <laughs> nope, and, nope and ranch confirmed. <laughs> yeah. Which other breeds do you currently have planned for the game? This makes it very complicated. When you add in another purebred, so let's say maybe cough cough, I'm adding in the Morgan. I can't just add in one breed because now if you go and you breed a Morgan with a quarter horse, you're going to have an offspring. And to have all that work correctly, that offspring is going to be a crossbreed. So every time I add in another, quote, purebred, I have to add in the variations. So the next ah. group of horses will be six breeds, and it will be all derivative from a Morgan base breed. Wow, that's going to be a huge update. Oh, it's it's fun, um, because then I have to do the 150 coat colors with all of the markings, and then all of the paint markings, and then all the Appaloosa markings, and then the shape. Yeah, it's, it turns into a whole time. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's so much fun! I hate myself! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that, that's awesome, though. I'm actually quite, I'm quite excited for that update. Are you going to be ever adding draft horses? That's an interesting I question. I am. That will be another fun time because um, I'll have to come up with a cross. So obviously, in the real world, there is not going to be a legitimate name for every single cross in the world. So yes. some of these I'm having to kind of come up with and create. So like, for example, when you breed the Morgan and the Arabian, it's going to turn into a desert sport horse. So uh, that, you, yeah, that's that's sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to kind of create that option, but then if I add in another breed later, that desert sport horse can also be the offspring of that because you're breeding a Arabian to something like a sporty breed. So when it comes to drafts, I'm gonna have to create some names of different things like maybe a desert draft or you know stuff like that that would actually make sense a drafty yeah. desert a drafty desert horse yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's fun it's fun it's fun make a game they said yeah, make a drama youtube channel they say oh my gosh yeah you might want to go back <laughs> to the person who said that don't do that kids don't <laughs> do that <laughs> do not try this at home <laughs> Do not try this out. <laughs> okay, so uh, next question is the art. I actually quite like the art. It's very cutesy and cuddly, and I quite like it. So do you make it yourself, and when did you start making it, or how did you make it? Give us a little insight in, in your process there. So I have it distributed between different types of art. So the horse bases, when I first started, were drawn by my friend. And me and my friend had a huge argument, and we lost friendship over the years and so I had to redo all of the horse art that was not her art because we do not want to cause problems there and so I redid all of the horse graphics and so all of the horse graphics are me the backgrounds are going to be from Lucid Dimensions which is going to be a popular DHRP artist on Instagram and DeviantArt and then I also have my friend Artistic Muser who um, is just a close friend that I've been friends with since the start of the game back in like 2016. And then I have a few people that do little small icons here and there for me that I commission out. Okay, so it's a it's actually what what you're saying is a, it's a huge team effort to keep to keep the art essentially flowing. Yes. Yeah, no, I I actually kind of suspected that I'm thinking about the situation with Swim. And uh, they wanted to do, I think, 5,000 plus coats or something for the yeah, game. That's insane. It's an insane amount. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's freaking. I think that I think that was the last number I saw. But um, like the amount of people that you would need to make each of those coats 
and <laughs> I have no. people come to me all the time who are like, oh my gosh, can I make coats for your game? And I'm like, okay, what coat do you want to add in? And they're like, I want to add in a bay coat. And I'm like, well, I already have a bay coat. And they're like, well, I want to make another bay coat. And I'm like, yes, but you do not understand what you are signing yourself up for. Because if you make a color, like let's say you're just doing a color, you've got to create it on all of the full bases, all of the adult bases, and you've got to make sure that all of the shading stays correctly and that all of the the texture stays correctly so that it all looks correct. I have people all the time, they're like, I'll do one breed then. I'll, I'll follow your, your template. Give me your template. I'll do it for you. And I'm like, let's say that it takes you five minutes to complete one color. I said, that is about 72 hours worth of work for all of it that you're telling me you want to do for free. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not ethical. I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know, like I tell them no, and then they get upset with me. And I'm like, look, I am not playing the I made game or I made art for Rope and Ranch and Rope and Ranch didn't pay me game. Like not happening. So I tell people no. Yeah, that that's actually interesting. An interesting uh, part, I think, of development as well, especially when you're freelancing and when you're or when you're independent, essentially, is um, you you need to learn when to say no, because a lot of people want to help you get you get these really wonderful people online who think that, well, you know, who believe that they can help, you know, they can code a little, they can do some art, or they can, you know, write stories, or they can do all of these wonderful things. And they will say, hey, look, I want to help. But the thing is saying no to these people is often the best thing for the game. It's not yeah. necessarily nice to them, but you as a developer need to think, okay, will this person coming in cause me more problems or will this person coming in help? So it's, it's you like people listening to this. You never know what your relationship um, is going to be like with a person two years later. Yes, exactly. But beyond that, I just want to say that to people listening who, you know, who want to help developers, you know, rather respect the fact that they do say no. They're not usually not saying no because they're ungrateful or they they don't want your help. There's often a good reason for why, or not often, but mostly, <laughs> often, more often than not, a good reason for why they're saying no. And it's mostly to do with internal workings and stuff that they know are going to cause them problems down the long run. Um, yeah, just something I think that a lot of people tend to forget. They're good natured and they mean well, but it's like, no. No, exactly. I've had I've had people <laughs> come to me under 18 too, and they're like, I can do it and you can pay me like a dollar. And I'm like, okay, a dollar is not what this is worth. Do not sell yourself short. And I can't do it for mm. someone who's under 18 because you can't legally sign the rights over to me either. Like they, can come, they can come back in two years when they turn 18 and say, I did work for you and you made me do work for you under as a kid and you didn't pay me and I didn't sign over that you know I've had people do that before and it just it's not worth it yeah no no definitely I've done that before too don't like you just said don't sell yourself short the next question I really want to ask is about, we have some very heavy topics we're discussing here like yes. what the buck red you did give me very <laughs> very heavy topics I have bullet points. Keep, I have a document here. Keep it light. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the disciplines. Let's hope this stays light. There are a few disciplines in Rope and Ranch, racing, show hunting, side saddle, and dressage. I think I got them all. Uh, why pick those disciplines in particular? And will you be adding more in the future? So when you select Western or English, there are six competitions that you can enter for each one. So the ones you named are going to be all under the English discipline. So when you select Western, you'll get things like barrel racing, roping, cutting, stuff like that. Those are what I call... Agar, I missed them. You did, <laughs> you sorry. did miss them. <laughs> Those are what I call basic competitions. Um, for example, a Spanish sport horse, when it comes to the order of skills, is stamina, jumping, and dressage. When a quarter horse has the same skills, but just in a different order, they have dressage, stamina, and jumping. Both of them have the same top three skills, but with that order being different and the percentage of that skill being a little bit different for each breed, the quarter horse will dominate the Spanish sport horse in a Western pleasure competition because it uses dressage and stamina. So that's the way that the mechanics of those basic competitions work. Now, obviously, if you have a 
um, Spanish sport horse that is going to be a little bit higher in a genetic potential than that quarter horse entering, it has a chance of winning. But these competitions are the base level. They earn every, every winning. First through fifth will give you moons and coins. And so it's to help keep the game running, keep those uh, people getting coins and moons for when they need it. It's that basic mechanic in the game. But I do plan on adding a whole new mechanic that wouldn't replace this one, but would be something I'm thinking of calling like a path. So mm-hmm. since a uh, quarter horse, like so barrel racing is uses uh, speed and gallop. Those are the two skills that a barrel racing horse would need. So now instead of completely training your horse, if you completely train them in speed and gallop, and you win 10 basic barrel racing competitions, the user would get like a pop-up on their screen that would say, congratulations, you won 10 barrel racing competitions. Would you like to specialize in barrel racing? And that horse would then be able to specialize specifically in barrel racing and would be able to go to like almost Grand Prix kind of competitions that would compete against NPC horses. So now it wouldn't rely on other people entering those competitions. And, but it would base off of the best horses in the game. So if you can win those competitions with those stats, then you would get like a ribbon, or I'm thinking of even maybe doing like where those horses level up. And now if you breed like a level two with a level two, the offspring, I don't know. But that's kind of where my brain's been going with it, is that it would be like a pathway that you could set for those barrel racing horses. Because right now, people get to breed for confirmation, and people get to breed for um, the genetic potential and the coat color. But a big aspect in horses is that competing, you know? And I Mm. wanted to be able to find a way that I could still make a big competing path for those people that are like, I want to have a number one barrel racing horse. And that there would be a pathway that those horses could take. I think that's an absolutely brilliant idea. I love it. The second you said it, I was like, yeah, no, I love this. Because the I, it's it kind of gives instantly a, a sort of special feeling for the horse that you have. And then you can have like a bunch of horses that are specialized in battle racing. Then you can have like a stable that's focused on it. It's I don't know. I, I love the idea. It's really cool. Awesome. I'm really <laughs> excited to be able to bring that to life. I, I've started the planning on it, um, but I'm mm. waiting for this release gonna... of cows before I go ahead and do that. Ooh, which is actually the next thing we're going to be talking about. Uh, you have other animals in the game as well. So I would like to know a little bit about that. Why did you choose to add goats? With... I think I might actually know the answer to this, though. You said that it was an inspiration for a ranch. So is it possibly that the reason you added the goats and the, the donkeys? And I think the chickens is currently there. Chickens is coming after cows. So okay. that's going to start being brainstormed once I've gone through. So we've gone through a lot of things that I plan on adding. Um, once I finish with cows, I want to do the competitions and I want to do those next six breeds of horses. And then I want to start focusing back on to the next feature, which is going to be chickens. Yeah, I, I always planned on it for not being a horse game to be a ranch game. You know, that's, you know, there's so many horse games out there. I want to be the next big ranch game. You know, you get to have your different pastures. You get to have the different fencing types. You get to have the different barns, the different livestock, the different things that you can do with them. So with goats, you can breed them for milk, meat, or show. So there's six breeds of goats. You can choose from like Alpine goats to Nubians, Nigerians, all different breeds. And then you can focus on trying to have the best milk goats and their best milk stats. They get milk traits. So maybe one goat might have the best traits in the game, but it's a little stubborn. And so it kicks the bucket over and you don't get all the milk Mm -hmm. on that goat. And stupid goat, you're going to the processing plant. So now you get meat in play. So you can breed, you know, the, um, the boar goats and you can breed boars for meat and you can get a big chunky goat and send them to processing and get coins for meat processing. Or you can have those show goats that you take into the show arena and show them and get cool show traits like a diva or stuff like that. Yeah, it's again, I love it. So so this is actually quite interesting. So 
the horses uh, are only one small part of this game essentially you want to grow it out to essentially like hold like um what's it encompass that's the word i'm looking for to essentially encompass everything that comes with the ranch so i'm gonna guess you're probably gonna be adding sheep as well at some point i do i want to do sheep uh i've had a lot of players start asking for like um more what are animals called when they're not mythical but they're cool and rare they are exotics oh. i've had oh, people ask for like exotic animals like can i have a peacock or can i have a camel and i mean in some countries they do they raise camels you know they might raise peacocks mm -hmm. so i thought of that being um maybe a way that i could do um like a bonus feature maybe you can buy an exotic barn for Five ninety nine, and now you've unlocked exotic animals or something like that. I haven't gotten that far yet. If I can, if I can maybe pitch in there, I think one that would be very maybe easier to add than a peacock <laughs> might be a llama or an alpaca. Yep, I've thought of those two as well. Yep, yeah, because they'll they'll have the base of the sheep essentially. Yep, yep. So yeah, it, it'll all come down to the same, you know, mechanics. But yeah, I, I'm super excited for that stuff later. So moving into the monetization of the game, uh, Rope and Ranch isn't very forced in microtransactions. It's very light in it. Uh, I want to ask you, do you think that that kind of hurts you? The fact that you aren't as aggressively filled with microtransactions like other games? Really hurting me, yes. Um, because I can only, with PayPal, I can only do it over 18. And so I can't do, you know, the, the ads. And with ads, I could have done with anyone. And they don't even have to click on the ads. They just have to have it on their web page for five seconds, mm. you know? And I would love, and that's another reason why I want to move over to mobile, is because if I could do that and I could make it into a mobile app, I could do the watch a short video. And they could get, you know, a little thing a little reward just to kind of ask is there any place where people can support you to kind of help this game grow a little bit so we have our discord server which has um mm -hmm. in-game discord um like subscriptions and if you do a subscription on discord you get depending on the tier that you opt into um you'll get horseshoes in game and the horseshoes can always be turned into um coins or they can be turned into moons or you can use them just as a horseshoe for items so it's kind of you know you can use that currency for whatever you want and then we've also got a patreon which is the same way every time that i get that notification every month i go ahead and i give out those bonuses that those patreons uh different tiers are connected oh. to I'll be sure to link both of those in the description below for those of you who are interested to kind of support this game. I'm supporting it, so yay! <laughs> well, I will be supporting it right after this. Anyway, <laughs> wasn't supporting before? Wow! <laughs> I see how it is. <laughs> Listen, I am broke. Uff. Yeah. You do not understand? College student. College student. No. Um, no, just, just South African. That's it. <laughs> I guess That's that works too. <laughs> <laughs> all I have is a shotgun and a revolver. That's I've heard I about the stories there. No. <laughs> yes. Do you want me to tell you one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. My aunt once got robbed. That was funny. Uh, no, that wasn't funny. <laughs> I've never so... heard someone say it was funny that their aunt got robbed. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, here's the story. My aunt and my uncle were both... A few minutes later... Rattles aunt for president. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rattles and for president. <laughs> I am for president. Just a quick heads up to all those sensitive viewers out there. The rest of this video will be going into the slaughterhouses of America. And some of the imagery might be a little bit upsetting to those of you who are a little bit more sensitive to animal abuse. So please be aware. But I did want to include this into the video as Rope and Ranch does try and bring attention to this. And I think it is something that needs to be discussed a little bit more in the equestrian community. On we go. Now that we kind of understand the game a little better, can you please explain to us how Rope and Ranch brings attention to slaughterhouses? Essentially, how are they linked? So in 2017, when I released the game, my original passion or, you know, the, the fire behind creating the game was all personal. I really, really wanted to make a game. This is just something I wanted to do. That's why I did it. But... 
in 2017, I had graduated high school and I went on to Craigslist because during high school, we sold my horse and I was very sad and I missed her. And so I went to Craigslist to see if there were any horse ads on Craigslist. And there was one that I came across that said, horses shipping to slaughter this weekend. And it was the weekend of my birthday. And I was like, what do you mean these horses are shipping to slaughter this weekend? And I followed all of the links and found my way through. And I found out that the number one kill pen in the country was located 45 minutes away from me. And I had no idea. And that it had been running for forever. And that this kill pen just was there. And I had no idea that this was happening 45 minutes away from my house. And so I went out there with a friend and my friend and I looked around and it was awful. It was absolutely awful. Um, this, this guy that... I guess I shouldn't name names, but he is the number one kill buyer in the country. If you Google him, you'll find it. This guy, he purchases horses at auctions. He brings them home to his house, which is also this kill pen. And he sorts them into four different pastures where the direct ship pen is one pen. And the let me post it on Facebook to the people who think that I'm saving horses pen is he'll post pictures on facebook he'll say this horse ships this weekend and i'm so sorry that i have to do this but it's going to happen it's inevitable and i need you to save it so if you give me 250 dollars on paypal with the name of the the tag number in the paypal description and make sure it's friends or family so you can't back pay then i will let you come and save this horse and Me and my friend drove up the next day and brought two of them home. And I asked him, I said, so I said, do these guys have Coggin paperwork? Which Coggins is something that every single horse in the world needs to have. It is for a uh, disease known as equine influenza and anemia, EIA. And it is, there is no cure. And if one horse gets it, another horse will get it. If your horse comes back positive for this, you have to euthanize the animal. And uh, I said, do you have the Coggins paperwork? And he said, oh, I must have lost it. And I just believed him. I brought my horses home. They were so Uh sick that I had to vet them myself because I was stubborn. And so I had to lance their uh, wounds that came on their jaw because they ended up getting strangles. I had to pump them full of medications. I had to get their weight back on their bones. I mean, these guys were skin and bones. Now, later on, I found out what all this is. And this is what's called the slaughter pipeline. So in the United States, multiple things funnel into the pipeline. And equestrians come and play rope and ranch. They come and they play all these games. But most of the people that are coming to these games are going to be the girls that go to their, you know, uh, barn. They ride a horse for 30, 45 minutes and then they go home. They have no idea what else is happening in the, the horse world community. And there might be some people who, like me, grew up on a farm 45 minutes away from the number one kill pen in the country. And have no idea that this is what's going on. And essentially what's happening is these horses are being brought to auctions all across the United States. They're getting pumped full of medications so that they do not look sick. Kill buyers are going in. They're purchasing these horses and they'll bring them to their own location. They'll try to give them more food to fatten them up. But essentially, most of them are so sick, they can't even stand. Gashes wide open on their bodies. Some are pregnant. Some are two-month-old foals. Then they load them full in a trailer, and they ship them to slaughter across the border of Mexico and Canada. And now, I wanted to share a link with you, and I'll share it with you. But there are multiple videos out there about how horse meat in the United States is considered toxic. That's why they shut down 
slaughterhouses in the United States. Now, I've had people combat me multiple times. Oh, you can still slaughter a horse in the United States. Yes, if you want to go outside and kill your horse, go kill your horse. I'm talking about taking your animal to a slaughter facility where they will kill your animal and process it for human consumption. That does not exist in the United States. It's illegal. But you can take your horse across the border to Mexico and you can have it done in Mexico. And guess what? It's no longer made in the United States. It's made in Mexico. It's made in Canada. And so now they're getting away with the fact that this meat is being processed in a country that's not the United States. They're shipping this toxic meat with phenylbutazone across the border to Europe and people are eating it. So round, round talk here. I made sure that Rope and Ranch touches base on this. So every month there is the biggest number auction in the country located in Bowie, Texas. It's actually happening this weekend. And these horses are, there's about 700 horses in these auction situations. So I am partnered with All Seated in a Barn, which is going to be a group with Talia who owns this barn. Uh, they go into the auction. Typically, they can rescue about 50 or 60 horses per auction, which is nothing compared to the 700 that end up getting shipped, but it's something. And the way that she calculates it out is that if every month she's going in and she's saving 50 or 60 horses from this fate, that it adds up at the end of the year, that's like 700 horses. That's 700 horses that the kill buyers are no longer benefiting from selling across the border. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the fact that they're not benefiting, it's the awareness that every single auction is bringing. Um, and I would like to point out that I've had multiple people come to tell me that eating horses is not a wrong thing. No, it's not. If you wanna eat a horse, that is completely your personal preference. But the problem that's happening here in the United States is that these animals are pumped full of medication. If you go and you eat a cow, that cow cannot have any medications in its system for three weeks, sometimes four weeks, depending on what medication. These horses are being slaughtered two or three days after getting this medication injected into their bloodstream, into their muscle. And so these horses are pumped full of this medication. And then when their meat is processed and humans are eating it, it's toxic. If we want to do this in a way that's going to be benefiting the overpopulation issue of horses and the fact that some people want to eat horses, then let's do this right. Let's bring these horses in. Let's make sure that the horses are not filled with cancer. Let's make sure they're not pregnant mares. Let's make sure that they are raised and bred for human consumption, that they are getting that, that period of time off of that medication in order to have that time and that people can actually safely eat them. Yeah, this this was a this was a rough topic. I didn't think it got, it went that deep. I also wasn't a, I also wasn't aware about these essential scams that these people are running in order to make quick bucks out of people. You know, out, essentially out of emotional manipulation to get little girls to fall in love with, you know, to save horses. Essentially, that's really what it comes down to. Which is which is rather tragic in the sense that they don't know any better. You know, and it's if if your ten year old daughter comes up to you and she's absolutely in tears because this poor pony is going to get slaughtered you're most likely going to try and save the horse. It's, oh, it's actually quite sick. It is. And what's even worse is I've had people who have gone either to the auction or gone to the kill pen and they've purchased these animals. And when they come home and the medication wears off of these animals, they'll try to kill that 10 year old because mm -hmm. they're really actually an aggressive animal who's been pumped full of medication to make them look nice, to make them not look sick. And at these auctions, they, uh, they're they sold on a red light, which means no refunds. They oh will not even take the God. animal back from you. This this is an ugly thing that's going on in America. Oh my gosh. I'm glad you're bringing attention to it. I think more people do need to know about it. It is. It's a big problem. And there's so many different things that are funneling into it. There is thousands of land that is owned by the Bureau of Land Management. And they mm -hmm. have these wild horses that are located on these land, the, this, this acreage. And these horses are getting corralled up by a helicopter chasing them out in the wild. 
They corral them up, they castrate the males, they put them in a pen, which is going to be like five acres big. And these horses have been sitting out there during this summer in the United States, where it's been over a hundred degrees some days with no shelter. There's been multiple people that have been raising awareness of this this summer specifically because these horses are dropping like flies in these holding facilities. But the BLM offers a beautiful incentive. If you go to the BLM, you can go and purchase the horse and you'll purchase them for $25. And when you purchase them, you can take them home. You can do whatever you want with them, but you cannot sell them for a whole year. And after a year, if you still have that horse and it is still alive, the Bureau of Land Management will write you a check for $1,000. So this incentive came out so that people could go and rescue these horses, get $1,000 after a year, and they wouldn't end up in slaughter. But what's happening is these people, and you're able, each person, so if you have a four-person household, four people can go to this house, to this place, and they can bring home 16 horses but they will bring the horses home. They'll make sure that they get females. They'll put them in a pasture with a stallion. They'll get them pregnant. After a year, the BLM will write them a check for $16,000. They'll take all of those horses to the auction who have now given birth and all of them have three month old babies. And they'll sell them for about $25 to $3,200 each at the auction because they're a horse with a baby and now they're making $3,200 a pop off of all of those horses that they just got 16 grand for. And all of those horses wow. were loaded up and taken to slaughter. Oof, that is, um, yeesh. And we're seeing it more and more every month. Last month, the guy ended up putting it in, with, in a pasture with a zebra stallion and said, oh my gosh, all of these mares are pregnant with a zebra Zorsi baby. And those horses sold for fifty six hundred a pop. Yeah, I know this though. It's a scam. It's it's like I feel like everything in America becomes a scam if it just sits long enough. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> Thank you for telling us about that. Uh, I would like you. I, I, I will share any of the links and stuff that you send along to me just to give people the chance to kind of read through this themselves, articles and everything like that. You know, I, I always like people to do their own research and to see these things for themselves. So if you can send me all those links, that would be wonderful. Sure. But um, it is upsetting to hear, uh, sorry, it, 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 it is upsetting to hear that this is happening. And it's good to know that there are people, you know, well, that you're using Rope and Ranch as a as a sort of a, a little a fun, sounds, sounds weird, but a, a, a more eased up gateway into kind of bringing attention to these types of things. Because... Everyone will play a game. Not everyone will go read up on horses and maybe, you know, on, on slaughterhouses and these types of things that are happening. So maybe through Rope and Ranch, more of this will become, you know, apparent to people. And maybe, you know, we can, people can start maybe be, be a little bit more aware of it and maybe do their part. That's, that's, I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping that by raising awareness with young equestrians, that as this gets mm. older, equestrians get older, as this, this whole next generation of horse people they'll know what this is. They'll know that, you know, I might really, really, really want to get that amazing warm blood, but I could just contact a rescue because there's so yeah. many horses in these rescues. There's so many horses out there that are ready for a new home because these rescues are trying to get these horses out of this system. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. I actually, like literally today, um, I went to a shelter um, for my dad. We're looking for a dog for him. And it was a little overwhelming for him, but I, you know, I forgot how overwhelming those places can be. And, uh, but the, the, here's the thing, like we have a shelter there. And when we ask them, hey, you know, what do I need to pay in order to get a dog? They just said, make a donation. And I was like, well, that's actually quite cool, but that's the way these places are supposed to work. You're not supposed to pay two hundred and fifty dollars to get a horse. You're supposed or to get these animals. You're supposed they, they are they work on donations. That's the way these places function. Yeah. But um, yeah. So if if you go up to a place and they say to you, you need to pay two hundred and fifty dollars or two hundred or one hundred dollars to save this horse, back away. It's a scam. And uh, rather go to you know places like actual shelters and go ask them for horses because like you said there are a lot of horses that are wonderful animals that really deserve new homes and that's something i think that people have a very strange idea around shelters it's like you know they look down on them and i'm like why <laughs> well if you think a horse is too cheap 
It is. You know, if yeah, it, it's just it's insane because people will go and post their horses for sale on Craigslist for a hundred dollars. They just want it to go to a good home, and mm-hmm. these kill pens will contact them, and will go and pick up the animal, and they'll take them to the auction and try to flip them for more. And then that horse is now in the system. And so, if you think an animal is too cheap, it is. And never, never sell your animal for too cheap. Your animal is who you love. You know, if if you can't take care of your animal anymore, contact a rescue. They will take it. You know, it'll it'll go to a good place, but it won't end up in the system. You know, and and you might not get money off of it, but so what? Your animal is going to a good place. You know, I mm. it's just insane that like people will not take their animals to a rescue instead of just they're letting them sit in the pasture. They're letting their hooves get too long. You know. Exactly. No, no, it's it's that. It's uh like you say, you know, it's it's your animal, it's your best friend, it was someone that you had for how long? And even if it wasn't, it's still an animal that that trusts you and that expects you to even in this time where you're where you're essentially letting it go, it's trusting you to look after it and to make sure that it goes to a place that it's going to be happy. And uh that is your responsibility. If you don't want to take that responsibility, give it to someone who will be able to do them, to make the right decisions for it. But um anyway, so yeah, woof, like dark subjects, good grief. <laughs> but you're all about <laughs> rattle. A, what do you mean? Uh, nah, I'm gonna have to put a warning at the front of this freaking video. Like, for younger viewers, please be aware. <laughs> <laughs> so the final thing, is there anything else you would like to add? I think that people within the horse community are looking for games that have community and as someone who built this game as a kid you know i i didn't come into this with a business degree i didn't come in th- with this as a company wanting to make a horse game i came into this as an individual who grew up on a farm who wanted other horse friends online rope and ranch is a community you know we we play minecraft together sometimes we we play the game together. We talk together. And you I mean, you've interviewed it. You you know what the horse community is. It's a chaos infested tragedy. And I'm not going to let that happen here. I, I have worked too hard with my personal time on Rope and Ranch to make that happen. And I want everybody to know that even if you don't play the game and you want horse friends, and you want someone to hang out with, come hang out with us, because that's what it should be about. It should be about the the fun, not just the game. I don't, at the end of the day, I, I don't care about the money. I don't. You know, I enjoy the fact that the site supports itself right now, but it was always my dream to do something for other horse people. And that's that's what I'm doing. I'm raising awareness about this big deal and I'm having fun with horse people. And I get to meet amazing people like, you know, you. I get to meet people like you and people like, you know, across country that that have other stories and and that's that's what it's all about. Yeah, I think that you summed it up very well. I think that the horse community in general has kind of maybe lost sight of what is important at the end of the day. It's it's one of the reasons why I personally try to drag in as many content creators as I can into my videos, because that's how you grow community, when you're willing to communicate and talk to each other. And like you said, have fun. It's, it's, it is about the game. I, I, I do think, you know, we should have some standard, but at the end of the day, we should be able, we should be able to discuss the standards, discuss the things that we don't agree with, and still sit down and laugh about a bad French joke. No, right. <laughs> Which is what we do. <laughs> right. Right. Red, this was an absolute pleasure to have you here on my channel. It was really fun chatting with you. We went into some dark subjects on this one, but it's always interesting to kind of get these different perspectives and to hear the sides of game development that I don't think a lot of people always want to chat about. So I had a lot of fun. I hope my viewers had fun. And for those of you who are traumatized, I will leave videos <laughs> and links in the description <laughs> below to help you through this troubling time. You make sure you... <laughs> Uh, you have like a little stress ball at the end for them i will yes just just squeeze the stress ball guys you'll get through this don't worry it's okay and if, and, and if it doesn't help just crawl under the bed and just wait there until the spiders stop spinning so- <laughs> why are there spiders under their bed i don't know i'd be more traumatized <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, um... <laughs> I'm just laughing at myself now, wait. <laughs> I'm rattled, and I like spiders under my bed. Fucking idiots. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here, Red. Uh, uh, yeah, I, where was I? Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Red. For those of you who are interested to see a little bit more about Rope and Ranch, I have all the links in the description below. Please be sure to check it out. I personally quite like the game. As someone who doesn't play a lot of browser games, I found it to be quite fun and entertaining. And if you guys want me to do a review about it, please let me know. But yeah, that was the review. Thank you for being here, Red. You can say bye now. Say bye, Red. Oh, goodbye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I got this, I got this. <laughs> No, I think that summarizes it all up. And uh, thank you. Uh, you have a great rest of your day. Go get some sleep. Bye bye, guys. How the f do I stop this thing again? Wait. Stop. Tell Craig to die. <laughs> Wait. I can. I can do this. Did it? Did it stop? Stop. Stop. Craig is still here. Craig. Craig, leave. <laughs>